So hello and welcome to another episode of Geographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about the Mariana Trench, the deepest hole on Earth. Original article by Larry Holsworth. It's generally known that the highest elevation on planet Earth is the peak of Mount Everest in the Himalayas. Less well known though is a somewhat intriguing fact. If somehow a giant scythe could be used to shear Everest from its base at sea level, and the mountain were to be placed at a certain spot in the western Pacific Ocean to rest upon the bottom, its peak would remain below the surface. In fact, it would not only be underwater, its highest point would be just six miles above the sea floor, yet more than a mile beneath the surface. That point in the ocean is a narrow gorge known as the Challenger Deep, and it is the deepest known location in the world. It is found cut into the floor, much like a slit in a loaf of bread of a crescent-shaped underwater valley known as the Mariana Trench. The trench takes its name from the Mariana Islands, which lie about 125 miles to the west. The islands consist of the Northern Marianas and Guam. Guam, the southernmost of the islands, is a territory of the United States, whereas the Northern Marianas are a commonwealth of the United States. Possession of the Marianas also gives the United States possession of the waters surrounding the trench through the enforcement of exclusive economic zones. President George W. Bush reinforced this authority in 2009, when, through a proclamation he created for the Mariana Trench National Monument, the National Monument entails and protects over 95,000 square miles of submerged lands and waters throughout the Mariana Archipelago. And Challenger Deep, the Earth's deepest spot, is outside the defined borders of the monument. One would reasonably expect the deepest penetration into the Earth's surface to be the spot on the surface close to the Earth's centre core. Reasonable perhaps, but wrong. How could a spot be the deepest on Earth but not be the closest to the centre, we hear you ask? The answer lies within the effects of the Earth's rotation on its shape. As the Earth rotates, it flattens its poles and bulges along the equator. Thus, the starting point for a trip to the core from Litka Deep is closer to the destination than one setting out from the Challenger Deep, despite the latter being further below sea level. The great depths of the Mariana Trench have intrigued oceanographers, biologists, geologists and other scientists for over one and a half centuries. It's been explored using methods as primitive as lowered cables to measure its depths, to modern echo sounding and other methods. Its deepest spots have been explored, though in the case of manned vehicles, sparingly. Despite the great pressures from the sea, the absence of light and the cold temperatures of the water, living organisms have been found there. Many are found nowhere else on Earth, while others are commonly found in the ocean depths around the globe. In 1872, Britain's Royal Society at the University of Edinburgh, with the support and cooperation of the Royal Navy, launched an extended exploration and scientific expedition to measure ocean temperatures, currents, and as much as possible about the shape and depth of the ocean's bottom at several locations. The expedition put to sea the HMS Challenger, a relatively small wooden sailing vessel stripped of its guns for the voyage. The Challenger carried special hydrographic equipment, chemical and botanical laboratories, and a large team of scientists to supplement the ship's crew. In addition, Challenger carried dredging equipment to obtain soil samples from the seabed and over 180 miles of hemp cable coiled within its holds. The ship departed Portsmouth, England in December 1872, eventually circumnavigating the globe during its four-year voyage. In March 1875, Challenger was working off the Mariana Islands, then a Spanish colony, when its scientists reported soundings, measurements of the depths beneath the ship's keel, of 4,475 fathoms. A fathom is a unit of measurement equivalent to about six feet. The depth reported was so astounding that a second sounding was ordered, which confirmed the first. The expedition had discovered the southern end of the Mariana Trench, and using weighted hemp cables had hit the ocean bottom at a depth of over five miles. Over the century and more since, far more sophisticated methods of measurement have confirmed those taken by the Challenger. By the way, HMS Challenger was also the namesake for its ill-fated Space Shuttle Challenger in the 1980s. In 1898, the United States seized Guam following the Spanish-American War. The Americans recognised the island's value as a refuelling station for ships, as burning coal was their main source of fuel. The following year, an American coal ship known as the Collier took soundings of the vicinity previously explored by the British. The ship, USS Nero, reported a sounding of over 5,000 fathoms. Over the ensuing years, several vessels of different nationalities conducted soundings in the area. In 1907, the shape and location of the Mariana Trench appeared in German publication, a handbook of oceanography, described and charter by oceanographer Otto Cronell. Dragging heavily weighted objects during soundings allowed mariners to determine the depth, length and width of the trench. By the beginning of the 20th century, its shape, generally a crescent, was known with a high degree of accuracy. Scientists were also able to secure soil samples from its bottom and varying locations along its sides, yet much of the trench remained a mystery. For example, water bottles could obtain samples to measure salinity, but temperature measures were impossible since temperatures of the obtained samples would change during its long ascent to the surface. The Mariana Trench was known as the deepest place on Earth, but its many other mysteries remained hidden.
As previously noted, Guam became an American possession as a result of the Spanish-American War, though the United States had no interest in the rest of the Marianas. The remainder of the Northern Marianas chain was sold up to Germany by Spain in 1899. Germany held the chain until it was invaded by the Japanese during World War I. Japan retained control of the islands with the exception of Guam until World War II. The Americans held Guam due to its usefulness as a fueling station for naval vessels and Pan-American Airway Clipper flights to and from the Orient. The Japanese took Guam in 1941, shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. In 1944, the Americans returned and the Marianas the island chain as well as the sea surrounding them were the scene of some of the fiercest fighting of the Pacific War. Following the war, in the early days of the Cold War, the strategic value of the islands dictated that Americans retain them as air and submarine bases. Bombers based in the Marianas flew missions over Vietnam during that conflict and American submarines operated from Guam for decades. In 1986, the Northern Marianas Trench became a Commonwealth of the United States, with the people of the islands electing a delegate to the US House of Representatives. Yet, despite American sovereignty over the islands and the surrounding territorial waters, the Marianas Trench has remained open to international exploration. In 1930, the British Royal Navy commissioned HMS Challenger as an ocean-going survey vessel. During the Second World War, Challenger served as an escort vessel before returning to oceanographic duties in the post-war years. In 1950, after a thorough refit and modernisation, Challenger was commissioned to lead the Challenger 2 expedition, a circumnavigation of the globe which included a complete echo-ranging survey of the Mariana Trench. Led by Dr Thomas Gaskell, Challenger used the process of echo-sounding, bouncing sonar waves off of undersea objects on the walls and bottom of the trench. The results confirmed much of the older cable dragging surveys and generated more precise images of the shape and makeup of the trench. Challenger measured a depth near the spot located by the original Challenger recorded it as 35,760 feet, nearly 6.8 miles. This spot is known as Challenger Deep, named for both the 19th and 20th century survey vessels. In 1957, the Soviets arrived with a survey vessel, a former German cargo ship converted post-World War II to a scientific research vessel named Vityaz. The Soviet ship reported a site within the trench which it measured a depth of 36,161 feet. Some sources, including Britannica, claim the depth recorded by the Soviets was slightly deeper. However, Vityaz today is moored at the Museum of World Oceans in Kaliningrad with a number 11,022 the metric equivalent of their recording, painted prominently on the side of its hull. The site where the sounding was taken is known as the Mariana Hollow. Regardless of the Soviet claim, most descriptions of the trench still cite Challenger Deep as the deepest known spot in the oceans. In 1962, another means of measurement, the use of precise depth gauges, was used by scientists aboard the research vessel Spencer F. Baird. They reported another deeper measurement at Challenger Deep, exceeding that of Challenger 2's mission by just under 50 feet. By that time, the general public had actually become aware of the Mariana Trench, inspired by a pair of intrepid explorers and the unique vehicle they used to dive to the bottom at Challenger Deep, travelling, as it were, to the bottom of the world. A Bathy Escape is a self-propelled submersible attached to a float rather than a cable, as is the case in a Bathy Sphere. The crew compartment is wholly separate from the vessel's ballast tanks. The latter, being flooded, do not have to withstand the pressure imposed on the vessel at depth. The crew compartment structure, however, must withstand enormous pressures. In the case of Challenger Deep, the pressure on a submerged vessel is nearly 1,100 times atmospheric pressure at sea level. In the early 1950s, a Swiss oceanographer and scientist, Auguste Picard, designed and had built the Bathy Escape Trist, named for the then free Italian territory in which it was built. Thrice was unique in that it used iron for ballast, with its float tank filled with gasoline for buoyancy, gasoline being lighter than water. The vessel was positively buoyant, meaning that it had to be held in dive configuration or it would automatically rise to the surface. Breathable air was provided via oxygen bleed tanks and a rebreather system. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, was scrubbed from the air using filters designed for that purpose. Electrical power to run the trice motors and instruments, controls and lighting was provided via batteries. The crew could control the vessel's trim, speed and release iron and water ballast at will. To get into the crew quarters, which was suspended beneath the floats, the crew had to descend into a tube through the float section, surrounded by gasoline. Like, I'm not going to make the joke, but you can, you can make the joke in the comments. I know you want to. Picard's invention was purchased by the French Navy and used in the Mediterranean Sea for underwater exploration until it was purchased by the United States in 1958. The Americans modified the vessel, lengthening its float section for additional tanks of both gasoline and water, increased its ballast load and strengthened its crew section. They also modified its tiny crew cabin, which was barely big enough to allow two people inside. The new pressure sphere that held the crew cabin was manufactured by Krupp Steelworks in Essen, Germany, 
working in conjunction with a French firm. And the United States acquired Trist in 1958 for $250,000, the equivalent of about $2.6 million today. It also acquired the services of Jacques Picard. Jacques was the son of Trist designer, an oceanographer and engineer in his own right, and highly experienced in the operation of the Bathy Escape. In 1958, a US oceanographer, Dr. Robert Dietz, proposed Project Necton. He envisioned Necton as a series of dives, beginning with the shallow operations in Aprocarpa Guam and graduating to the deep dives into the abyssal of the Mariana Trench. Uh, for anyone curious, myself included, abyssal loosely refers to depths below 10,000 feet. The project would culminate with a manned dive to the Challenger Deep. Necton refers to the marine life that swims freely, unlike plankton, which merely drifts. Since the vessel could be used for dives, Trice could operate independently, that is, swim freely. Necton was chosen as the code name for the whole project. After modifications were complete, Trice was delivered to Guam via a cargo ship. The dives began in Apra Harbor in late 1959 with Trice manned by Jacques Picard and US Navy Lieutenant Don Walsh. For the third dive in the series, Trice and the support vessels monitoring its progress moved to the west coast of Guam and deeper water. Following its success, the research team relocated to the waters above the Mariana Trench. Prior explorations had studied the water columns above the trench, though until then little was known about its makeup and the effects on undersea vessels. For its fourth dive, Trice descended into the trench at Nero Deep, a canyon name for the ship that had originally charted it in 1899. The dive reached 18,600 feet, setting a new record for the deepest manned dive ever recorded, the former being held by the French Navy. The research team then returned to Guam to install new instrumentation, make minor repairs and prepare for the descent to Challenger Deep. Two more experimental dives took place before that mission though, one in Apra Harbor and one on Guam's west coast. In 1960, after USS Lewis, a destroyer escort, determined the exact location of Challenger Deep via explosive soundings, Trice began its descent on January 23rd. It took the two men nearly five hours to reach the bottom, the first time any vessel, manned or otherwise, had made the descent. It was a harrowing journey. An outer plexiglass window pane snapped with a resounding crack, unnerving both men temporarily. As they went deeper, the temperature in their compartment dropped, eventually reaching 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Like, what, what's that in Celsius? Like, what, what's that in like British temperature? 45 Fahrenheit in Celsius. Oh, okay, seven degrees. Okay, yeah, that's, okay, that's pretty cold. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to visualize that. Okay, that's pretty goddamn cold. A voice message using hydrophones transmitted to the ships on the surface took about seven seconds to be heard. A response took the same time. Both men reported seeing flatfish resembling flounder, even at the tremendous depths on the bottom. They reported the bottom as being ooze, and their lights revealed numerous types of what appeared to be living creatures. It took the two men about three hours to ascend back to the surface after they spent about 20 minutes sitting on the bottom of the world. It was not until March 25th, 2012, over 52 years later, that a manned vessel would return to the bottom of Challenger Deep. The exploration of the trench continued using remote vehicles and survey vessels um, during that time, and much has been learned about the trench. The Mariana Trench exists along the border between two tectonic plates, the Pacific Plate to the east and the Mariana Plate to the west. The edge of the Pacific Plate is pushed down beneath the Mariana, which forces parts of the Pacific Plate to rise, creating the Mariana Islands and submerged seamounts. The Mariana Trench is formed as the deepest section of that boundary. In sheer size, it is formidable, over 120 times larger than the Grand Canyon. The Mariana Islands and the submerged seamounts that permeate the region are volcanic. Several in the northern Mariana Trench are deemed active and there has been seismic activity within and along the trench for as long as its existence has been known to man. Scientists believe the trench is the oldest geological formation in the Earth's oceans. Within the water column above the trench, the temperature of seawater varies, dropping steadily with depth. At the bottom, the water temperature averages between 34 and 39 Fahrenheit, and the water density is nearly five times greater than that of the surface. The water along the bottom will be even colder still if it weren't for the superheated gases that are emitted from fissures along the bottom of the trench. In short, it is a hostile area for almost any living organism. Nonetheless, the Mariana Trench teems with life, including in its deepest areas, although scientists have long discounted Walsh and Picard's reports of flatfish swimming in its deepest point. It has been accepted that sea cucumbers, living organisms which thrive on the ocean's bottoms throughout the world, are found in great numbers on the trench's bottom. Yes, there are cucumbers on the bottom of the world. Some oceanographers and marine biologists have theorised that the sea cucumbers were the flatfish identified in that initial report. Hirondalia gigas, which resemble shrimp in some ways, also thrive in the greatest depths of the trench. They live, according to theory, on plant debris. How they survive the immense pressures from the depths is still unknown. 
Another species found in the trench is the blobfish. It's found between two and 4,000 feet below the surface. The blobfish gets its name from its appearance when it's raised out of its accustomed depth, which causes it to bloat outwards like a shapeless blob. In its regular habitat, it looks more or less like any other fish. Sucks to be a blobfish. Other bizarre creatures found in the trench include the anglerfish, hatchetfish, black sea devils, several types of shark, and numerous invertebrates. The trench is supported with so much life and in such wide variations that the US Fish and Wildlife Service maintains the Mariana Trench National Wildlife Refuge, with offices on Guam and Saipan in the northern Mariana Islands. The emergence of remotely piloted underwater vehicles, as well as manned submerged pools, increased exploration by private entities in the 21st century. Regulations regarding protections of wildlife within the Mariana Trench and nearby islands have been put in place by the US government and the authorities of the northern Mariana Islands. The National Monument divides the region into three diverse units, the Trench Unit, the Volcanic Unit, and the Reef Unit. Hopefully I don't need to explain why they're so named. Each unit has its own goals and plans for the preservation of wildlife and geological features within its domain. Recent unearthed evidence indicates protection of the vast area is needed, and in some cases, may have come too late. In 2016, a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration NOAA, expedition to the Mariana Trench made some discoveries that are disturbing to say the least. For example, during a 16,000 feet dive, uh, the NOAA was reported as saying, we saw multiple pieces of marine debris, a soda can, a food tin, and a piece of rope. These were among the discarded items found in the sea. The following day, the same expedition reported a piece of additional trash at another site within the trench, including several plastic bags and pieces of clothing. In 2017, the NOAA and other scientists reported toxic levels of pollutants within the supposedly remote waters of the Mariana Trench. And one of the pollutants were microplastics found within animal life. Polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, were found at higher levels than in any other known spot in the Pacific Ocean, with the exception of Segura Bay in Japan. Uh, in 2019, an American named Victor Viscova made what was at the time the only third man dive to the bottom of Challenger Deep, after Walsh and Picard. The other was made by a filmmaker, James Cameron. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot he did that in 2012. The year following Viscovo's dive, Dr. Kathy Sullivan, who had flown in space above the space shuttle Challenger in 1984, descended to Challenger Deep. Her dive was at the invitation of Viscovo, grouped in the same submersible. Viscovo descended to the bottom and remained there for about four hours, both observing and recording what he saw. Don Walsh, who was with Picard and had made the first descent in 1960, was on hand to observe the event from the surface. Among the multitude of strange and mysterious creatures Viscovo observed, he also recorded clear evidence of the presence of humanity in the form of a plastic bag, discarded by some unknown person of some unknown place and time. Somehow it had reached the bottom of the least explored and least known locations on planet Earth. He also reported seeing what the BBC would later refer to as sweet wrappers or candy wrappers to you Americans. According to the AustralianNews.com, another expedition to the trench photographed an inverted five gallon plastic bucket in the trench alongside remnants of a plastic balloon. The latter decorated with images from the film Froze. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. Oh. Oh, that's bad. Additional studies have revealed that marine animals in the trench also contain high levels of carbon radiation. Yet yeah, why not? Why not after all that? Likely left behind in the ocean during nuclear weapons tests in the 20th century. Plastic trash, PCBs, carbon-14, and who knows what the f*** else is down there. A clear case that the humans affect the conditions of their home anywhere on the globe. Many factors affect the movement of pollutants in the ocean, including currents, but the fastest means of spreading microscopic pollutants is via the food chain. In the oceans, the food chain moves from the depths to the surface. It is inevitable then that pollutants found in the deepest spots on Earth, as well as in its surrounding waters, will reach the top of the oceanic food chain, at which point it will transfer to land-based mammals, including humans. So it would seem that the Mariana Trench is not as remote as has long been believed. Uh, so thank you for tuning in to this episode of Geographics, and thank you to Larry Holsworth for writing the original article on which this video was based. I've been your host, Cal Smallwood. Um, you may recognise me at this point from the other uh, sister channels to this one, Biographics and Top Tens. I'm the interim host, and I wrote for Top Tens many years ago, and I have my own channel, Fact Fiend with Cal Smallwood, which you could no doubt find linked below. Uh, thank you for watching, like, comment, and subscribe, and as always, have the day you deserve.